Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good, good afternoon if you're joining us here in Washington and if you're tuning in from Australia, a very early good morning. Uh, I'm Charles Edel, the inaugural Australia Chair and Senior Advisor here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and I'm pleased to welcome you to the book launch of Major Mick Ryan, Major General Mick Ryan's new book, War Transformed, The Future of 21st Century Great Power Competition and Conflict. I'm joined here today uh, by my colleagues, Elliot Cohen, uh, the Arlie Burke Chair of Strategy here at CSIS, and also the Robert Osgood uh, Professor at Johns Hopkins School of uh, Advanced International Studies, uh, and Emily Harding, the Deputy Director and Senior Fellow with the International Security Program here at CSIS. I'm, of course, also joined uh, by the book's author, uh, Major General Mick Ryan of the Australian Army. Uh, by way of introduction, General Ryan graduated from the Royal Military College, Duntroon, in 1989. And since then, he has commanded Army units at the Troop, Squadron, Regiment, Task Force, and Brigade level during a three-decade-long career. Major General Ryan has a Bachelor's Degree in Asian Studies and is a graduate of the Australian Defense Forces School of Languages. He speaks Indonesian, I'm told. He is a distinguished graduate of the United States Marine Corps' Command and Staff College and a graduate of the Marine Corps School of Advanced Warfare. In 2012, he graduated with distinction from Johns Hopkins SICE with a Master of International Public Policy. Most recently, he was commander of the Australian Defense College. And he is a leading expert on military strategy, advanced technology, and as I hope we can discuss a little bit, the literature of science fiction as well. Now, that's the formal background. Mick is also an old friend. When we moved to Australia several years ago, I had just left teaching at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, very early in my tenure down under, General Ryan invited me to the Australian Defense College to give a talk uh, that I had, uh, based on a paper that I had written. Over lunch, he told me that it was a tryout. Now, I think I passed uh, because the Australian Defense College became a home away from home of sorts for me, and I returned as often as possible. The reason I did so was because of what General Ryan had made the institution into, a vibrant place of learning that leveraged technology and adopted its curriculum to offer a world-class education to senior officers in tactics, in operations, and most importantly, on the strategic environment that they were facing. It's a real honor to have General Ryan here today to launch his new book, War Transformed. Uh, the book continues his work of education uh, and educating the next generation of military officers by laying out how the world is changing, examining what we can learn from previous eras of rapid societal change, assessing what all this means for how we think about war and competition, and critically asking how to organize ourselves and our institutions and our people to make sure that they succeed in that environment. But I'd also say that this book does something more than that. It aims to give national security professionals not only a theory of war, but a method to learn and cultivate what General Ryan calls an intellectual edge. Uh, I'd like to invite General Ryan up here to talk about his book, after which uh, Elliot, Emily, and I will discuss it in and with him. And of course, to all of you who are watching right now, there's a Google form that you can, on the webpage that you can shoot your questions to and they'll come to us. With that, General Ryan, uh, the floor is yours, please. Well, thank you, Charles. That was a, a wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, CSIS for hosting us here today, uh, as well as uh, my fellow, fellow panellists, Emily and uh, Elliot. It's a great joy to be here with you all today, so thank you. Um, when I started thinking about what I was going to say today, I reached out to some friends for some advice, which in essence mean I tweeted uh, a request for advice. I got some pretty interesting feedback, and uh, there were three key themes. First, Thank those who supported you. Secondly, explain why this is important. And finally, and this was something I got from everyone, was keep it short. So that's exactly what I'll seek to do. 
but I'd like to take a very quick detour um, and tell you a short story of what's motivated me to write this book. Um, and my vote motivator, in short, is failure, or at least avoiding it through the study of history and the ongoing development in the profession of arms. Because you see, my career started with massive failure. I might have graduated from our Royal Military College, but before that, I was a cadet at our Defence Force Academy for a year, and I failed everything. I failed all eight subjects, and I was very fortunate that an Army General uh, looked at me and gave me a second chance. And I learned a couple of things from that. One, second chances are very important in the right circumstances. But secondly, I learned early about failure. And for me, it began an appreciation that failure can be an opportunity to learn and adapt. Now, too many leaders do not talk about their failures enough. We have all failed. Every senior leader has failed often, um, but the good ones learn from it and continue moving on. And that sounds like the topic for another book in the future. So in some respects, this is a book about learning from failure of others in times of significant change, from the recent to the distant past, and how leaders might profitably learn from it in peace and avoiding failure in war. Because failure does carry the highest of prices. That means we as leaders, both military and civilian, need to do all we can in the intellectual, physical and moral realms to buttress our societies and our nations against strategic failure in the 21st century. So while much of this book is the result of study and observation, many of the elements are based on what I've learned from my own experiences and failures over 35 years in the Army. I think it's important that I explain why now for this book. Now, when I started write, writing the book, which was just before COVID, we already lived in a world where superpower competition had returned. The last two years have only supercharged that competition. Now, the last two years have also made very clear to us the aspirations of China as a global technologically advanced and very wealthy autocracy. Its coercive behaviour, secrecy around COVID, its obsession with suppressing forms of dissent at home and abroad, all bode ill for the coming years and decades. Now, in the military realm, both China and Russia have developed new ideas about warfare and developed the means to implement these ideas. For Russia, we have seen new generation warfare, which builds on the foundations of previous Russian operational approaches, but better integrates non-kinetic activities with other agencies to a much greater degree. This more integrated approach before and during conflict was outlined in their July 2021 National Security Strategy. But from China, we have seen the concept of systems destruction warfare, which exists within a larger, more integrated national security complex. The Chinese descriptions of a more integrated approach to military and other national security activities was described all the way back in 1999 by the two colonels in their book, Unrestricted Warfare. And I'll quote very quickly from it, and they wrote, warfare has reinvaded human society in a more complex, more extensive, more concealed and more subtle manner. The new principles of war are no longer using armed force to compel the enemy to submit to one's rule, but rather using all means, including armed force or non-armed force, military and non-military, and lethal and non-lethal means to compel the enemy to accept one's interest. So my book explores competition with other large powers and delves into the difficult challenges of our nations and their military instruments need to adapt to be and remain competitive. Now, as we've seen from history, nations and military institutions that have lagged behind their competitors have paid a price with the lives of their people and sometimes with their national sovereignty. As the Prussians in 1806, the Russians in 1905, the French in 1940 and the Iraqis in 2003 learned the cost of paying insufficient attention to the competitiveness of one's military forces, intellectual, physical and technological, is extremely high indeed. Indeed, as Sir Michael Howard wrote of the technological competition in the lead up to the Franco-Prussian War, 
The social and economic developments of the past 50 years had brought about a military as well as an industrial revolution. The Prussians had kept abreast of it and France had not. Therein lay the basic cause of her defeat. And this competition is set against the background of massive changes in technology and society then and now. In particular, we're seeing rapidly advancing technologies of the 21st century and their military uh, applications at a pace that at times can be overwhelming for many folks. However, technology is largely a level playing field in military organisations. In the main, similar technologies available to the major powers and even middle-sized nations as my own home, Australia. For 21st century military institutions, building sources of advantage will include new technology, but it is not a complete solution to the many national security challenges of the coming decades. People and the new ideas and new institutions they produce are at the heart of my examination of building military advantage in this book. So what do I hope readers take away from reading War Transformed? Well, first, that they understand competition and conflict in the 21st century. And in undertaking that building of understanding, they appreciate that the continuities are just as important as the things that are changing. And it's important we understand what isn't changing because these continuities provide the firm foundations for adaptation and innovation. What isn't changing? Well, firstly, humans remain competitive animals. Fear, honour, interests are still important aspects of how we interact. Second, because of this, competition and war are not going away. They will remain enduring aspects of human culture. Third, we will continue to need clever, connected, capable and adaptive military forces and national security enterprises. And a fourth and final continuity is that we will keep getting surprised. Democracies excel at this. Surprise remains a central aspect of competition and war. No matter how clever we are, there is always someone else who seeks to use clever stratagems to surprise and defeat us. And this isn't just tactical surprise. Strategic surprise, technological surprise can also occur frequently and may do so, so more frequently in the future. A second message that I hope readers might take away is the need to change how we understand and use time. It is a very underappreciated resource in some parts. I would propose that democracies specialise in their use of time in 24 hour cycles, particularly around news cycles, and around three to four year election cycles. But we are weak in dealing with microseconds and in decades. This has to change because with the profusion of algorithmic approaches to war, hypersonic weapons and autonomous systems, war is speeding up and actions sometimes will be measured in microseconds. We need to understand this better. But at the same time, we are engaged in long-term competition and must develop improved political and societal capacity and patience for implementing strategies that will pay out over many years and indeed decades. The third and final message is that advantage in the 21st century that we construct new versions of that other trinity of people, ideas and organisations. It is the core idea of this book. Despite massive and ongoing advances in technology, it will be the combination of new ideas, new institutions and well-trained and educated people who will provide who will prove decisive for military organisations in 21st century competition and warfare. And each of these areas have their own chapters in the book. So who's the book for? Well, the primary audience, not the sole audience, but the primary audience is current and future military leaders. They are charged with the ethical application of violence to defend their nations and their interests. And these leaders must sustain a commitment to learning adaptation and effective values-based leadership over many decades. But however, just like the rest of society, they have experienced and witnessed large transformation within their profession over the last 30 years. The senior officer of today will have served in large-scale 
conventional force that faced off with the Soviet Union, converted to train and deploy to defeat smaller adversaries over the last couple of decades with a focus on enforcing the peace within fractured nations. They would then most likely to have deployed with an evolved and better connected force that conducted operations in the Middle East and South Asia over the last few years. These same officers must now adapt again to a world of revived strategic competition where the main competitor is larger, richer and more technologically advanced than any in living memory. There is one particular audience that I hope will read out this book that I'd like to call out. There is a new generation of junior officers and non-commissioned officers in military institutions around the world that has established a global informal network through their work in social media and blogs in the past decade. They have, in my personal view, recognised the study of war, competition and our profession and its future. It is this new generation of military leaders more than any other audience whom I wish to reach with this work. And it is they that will probably carry the heaviest load in the next war and they deserve every bit of support we can provide to ensure they are physically, morally and intellectually prepared. Before I conclude, I'd, I'd like to thank some people who were very important in the development, the writing, the editing and the production of the book. Firstly, once again, thank you to the wonderful team here at CSIS for hosting this event today. Uh, you've been fantastic. Um, Charles Edel, in particular, the inaugural Australia Chair here at CSS, uh, is a great friend and has been a wonderful advocate uh, for this work. Uh, Professor Elliot Cohen has been a teacher, a mentor and a friend over many, many years and his support has, has been wonderful. Uh, the United States Naval Institute Press, who are the publishers of this book, have been an absolute joy to work with and I hope to work with them again on a subsequent book. Uh, looking back in my home country in Australia, I'd like to thank our Chief of Defence Force who has been an advocate and supporter of this work, uh, work over the last few years. I'd like to thank my many friends in the profession of arms from the United States, Australia, Indonesia, India, Canada and beyond for their mateship and their support over 35 years. And finally, most importantly, my family, Jocelyn, Dana and Cara, who have tolerated and sustained me in good times and bad, who have humoured me and my worst ideas at times and have always been there. I'll finish by saying that I've been privileged to work in this physically, morally and intellectually demanding profession for over 35 years. I hope that this book will aid other military leaders to adapt to the current era to ensure their nations can evolve and thrive in the 21st century. I'd like to conclude with a short quote from the great American historian Williamson Murray. And in one of his books, he wrote that war is neither a science nor a craft, but rather an incredibly complex endeavour which challenges people to the core of their souls. It is, to put it bluntly, not only the most physically demanding of all the professions, but also the most demanding intellectually and morally. The cost of slovenly thinking at every level of war can translate into the deaths of innumerable men and women, most of whom deserve better from their leaders. That's us. Our military and national security leaders carry a very heavy burden, and I hope this book assists them in carrying that burden into the future. Thank you. Nick, thanks very much. Uh, as I said, the way that we're going to proceed now uh, is we're going to turn it over uh, for comment, for thought, for interrogation, uh, and then uh, not only to Emily and Elliot, but to everyone who's watching. So again, there's a web page for the event. If you have a question, please launch it right there. We'll make sure that we get it up here. Uh, Dr. Cohen, your reaction. Well, thank you. Um, well, first, thanks for the uh, kind words, Mick. You and I have known each other for three decades now. Um, you know, I, uh, it's, it is, uh, or not three decades, less than that, about a decade and a half. It's, um, it's a truly wonderful book, um, and I think it's a wonderful book because it manages to be quite deep, 
while at the same time being very comprehensive in covering the field that you want to cover. Um, what I thought I would do would be, I actually have two questions which are related, one quite general and then one more specific. I think at the, at the heart of the book is your distinction between the nature of war, which you think is unchanging, uh, and the character of war, which is changing. And I'd like you to just talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to, if I could, I'd like to ask you to apply that to a particular case. I think, you know, there's this great debate around uh, is the nature of war changing? I think most times that debate is actually about the character wars, how we fight, what we fight with. Um, that is something that has changed constantly ever since the first caveman picked up a rock and threw it at his mate. Uh, the character of warfare has continued to evolve through technology, through new concepts, new organisations, new geography, those kind of things. But the nature of war is really about the human centricity. It's about how humans make decisions about warfare, about how warfare is about is uh, confusing, it's ambiguous, you know, the fog and friction of war. Um, and whilst humans continue to make all the decisions about warfare, which they do, and even if you have autonomous system, humans are still making decisions to deploy them. They're still making decisions about strategy. They're still making decisions about policy at the government level. I think that nature of war remains unchanging. But the character of war, we are seeing um, really interesting transformation at the moment, in particular through the use of autonomous systems in the land, sea and air domains, um, through the use of very clever um, bespoke algorithms in cyber warfare uh, with the use of space-based capabilities, um, space operations and those kind of things and then the integration of all those five domains which we haven't really seen I think in the operations in the Middle East. We've never had to compete in all five domains concurrently in those operations. The future is we will have to compete in all five domains concurrently in a way that we haven't had to before. So that is a really important part of how the character of war is changing. So let me um, take that, and of course there's a lot more than that as well in the book, uh, including, for example, your, your very interesting discussion about time. Let's apply it to the case that's before us right now, Russia and the Ukraine. You know, if this crisis had somehow been boiling over 20 or 30 years ago, and let's assume that the geopolitics were the same, which of course they weren't, you'd say, well, the Russians can invade, you know, with large armored forces, and then they'd be facing guerrilla warfare for a long period of time, and uh, it would be really bloody, and uh, who knows how it would end. It would depend on willingness to take casualties, uh, and so on. That's how does the changing character of war, because that word this is happening now, or potentially happening now, rather than 30 years ago, how would that look different? I mean, how should we understand this potential conflict differently than we might have you know, several decades ago? I think the, the first significant change is there's a level of transparency in what's happening on the ground in the build-up that, you know, 20 or 30 years ago would not have been possible. The profusion of civilian sensors, um, and connecting them and big data analytics in private uh, organisation has allowed most of us to track the Russian build-up through Twitter. Uh, there was a great series of articles in The Economist recently that explored this and there's some wonderful uh, Twitter feeds that you can track daily, even hourly, Russian uh, battalion tactical group movements, some of the more operational and strategic capabilities. I mean, that just wasn't possible 20 or 30 years ago. And that gives a level of transparency to the build-up uh, for um, a whole range of different government and non-government actors to monitor what's going on, to influence what's going on. Obviously, it still doesn't allow you to see into the mind of, of key leaders, but it gives us a level of um, access into what's going on that we haven't had previously. Secondly, when it comes to influence and information operations, our capacity to um, precisely target different audiences um, is, is unprecedented really in human history. I mean, influence and violence have always been two sides of the same coin. Uh, but the capacity now to target different audiences through very sophisticated analysis and algorithms and, 
and in social media and a whole lot of other access mechanisms. Um, you know, obviously the Russians are doing this because they're allowing us to see this build up. I mean, they're not doing this accidentally. Uh, but influence operations, I think, now is very, very different. The third piece I would just finish on is masses back. Um, I think a lot of people looked at the armoured advances of 91 and 2003 into Iraq and said, we'll never get away with that again. We'll never get away with the build-up. We'll never get away with mass ground operations and air operations like this again. Well, that's just not true. Um, mass looks different to what it did then, and there's a different balance of humans, machines, and autonomous systems. But mass still has a role to play in warfare. Um, and frankly, a lot of what we're seeing from the Russians at the moment, there's not too much grey zone there. It's very much punch you in the face, conventional combined arms, joint operations, and that will continue to be part of warfare into the future. It will just look slightly different than what it did in the past. Can I ask just one quick follow-up and then I'll, um, I'll stop? Do you think that, uh, again, we'll use this as, uh, as a case to explore the, the larger uh, question. Um, do you think if and when it actually comes to fighting, uh, the changing character of war means that this will look and feel somehow very different than it would have, again, uh, 30 years ago? And in particular, does it give one side or the other a bigger edge than they might have had, or either the Russians or, for that matter, the Ukrainians, advantage now in a way that they wouldn't have been 30 years ago? I think it was Andrew Marshall who said, everyone goes into a war with lots of different ideas, but after a short period of time, there's one idea. That's the one that is successful and, and wins and you don't lose people. So I think if there is a conflict there, and I don't think that's predetermined, but if there is a conflict, you will see a accelerated pace of learning which will continue to evolve our ideas about combined arms, joint warfare, um, that will be different to what we even know today. And everyone will circle around the idea that's most successful, the one that is most likely to give them victory. I'm not sure what that will look like because the interaction of people um, can sometimes throw up some very interesting ideas. Um, and I think of Sir Michael Howard said, you know, listen, you know, you can be as well prepared as you want, but the real key to success is once it starts, being able to learn and adapt more quickly than your adversary. And I think that will be one of the really important keys to success. I believe you're actually paraphrasing Mike Tyson, right? Everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face. Yep. Uh, but well, we can stay with Michael Howard yeah. <laughs> for the context of this. Uh, Emily, uh, other than Mike Tyson, would love to hear your uh, thoughts and reactions to Actually, next you read time. my mind. That's exactly <laughs> where I was going for the first one. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this concept of time that you cover in the book and also in your opening remarks. You talk about time speeding up in several ways. Mm. Uh, the dizzying pace of, advantage, of advances, AIML, biosecurity, tools bit, built to trick human understanding. I expect coming up in Ukraine, we're going to see a lot of things like deep fakes, very clever mis and disinformation. We don't have time to learn the lessons before the next advance, and we find ourselves constantly trying to keep up. This was something that I saw extensively in my time on the Hill. You were constantly trying to learn and then make law, but by the time the law made it through the legislative cycle, a year or two years, advances had vastly outstripped where you were with your particular piece of legislation. The learning curve is just too steep. So it's necessary to build in two things, and you cover this in the book. Flexibility, so especially when it comes to governments, flexibility in things like procurement, um, and then ethical checks. You talk a lot about the ethics of your profession and how you have to understand the moral core of your country in order to execute the mission properly. Uh, for Congress, I think that looks like oversight more than it looks like legislation these days because the legislation just can't keep up, but the oversight has to be extensive. But for humans and for soldiers, I think it has to do with civics education, really understanding what your country stands for and how you're supposed to make these decisions on the battlefield. On the battlefield, you talk about split-second life and death decisions informed by AI and ML increasingly, and then the flexibility to improvise on the battlefield. And this, in my mind, is one of the big advantages that Western militaries like ours have. You know, we, we teach our officers to improvise, to adjust. And then the ethics piece, you know, they, we try to teach why you're fighting to begin with. I'm a big movie buff. This always makes me think of Crimson Tide. Uh, the great quote by Gene Hackman, give me my command, a checklist, a target, and a button to push. All I got to know is how to push it. 
but they seem to want you to know why, of course, talking to Denzel. And he says, I had hoped they'd want us all to know why, sir. And that's really where we're headed. We're giving our troops these amazing tools and then asking them not only to understand the tool, but then also to understand why you're using it on the battlefield and thus when it's appropriate to use it and when it's not, when you need to have that moral check. Um, so this is a tough question though. How do you inculcate in your officers, in your foot soldiers, this moral core and this ethical reasoning in a time when there is so much mis and disinformation and when you know your guy on the battlefield is just as likely to see Russian disinformation on their Twitter feed as they are to listen to their company commander talking about why we're there and why we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. From your position leading men and women in battle, what would you say about the way to educate folks that way this today? Mm. Um, the most powerful augmentation of human beings is not bionics or biological or robotics or anything like that, it's training and education. It is uh, the most proven and will remain the best way to augment a human beings' capacity to, to do this. But I think central to that is in developing in your leadership um, the ability to ask the question why, but provide purpose. You know, to be able to develop purpose and provide purpose. It's not a military thing. It's from the very top all the way down. And if you can provide purpose all the way down, um, that's important for a couple of reasons. One, it allows you to ensure that your military forces are disciplined and conduct operations within the values and ethics of the country they represent. That's vital in, a, in any country, but particularly in democracies under civilian control of the military. But providing purpose allows people beneath you to innovate and find other ways to meet the purpose that you may not have thought of. Particularly when you're going through an era of quick change in technology and how people partner with some of these new technologies, purpose will drive that. Not tasks, anyone can give a task, but purpose will allow people to experiment and find new ways of not using machines, but partnering with them. And that's a bit of an unknown art in my view is we've, for thousands of years, we've trained people to use machines, to fly machines, to drive machines, to shoot machines. We're in an era now where we're going to partner. It's a bit of an unknown journey for our training and education. So purpose will help us with that. The third piece I think, and just getting back to why purpose is important is purpose inspires people. Um, no robot or AI will ever be able to provide this. No task will ever provide ins um, inspiration, but purpose. When you are leading people in the most difficult, dirty, wet, tiring, dangerous circumstances I'll ever be in, purpose inspires them to do things that they would not otherwise be capable in. So this capacity to build in our leaders at every level, from corporal to general and their joint equivalents and above, provide purpose will provide, will, will allow us to, I think, uh, have a more effective, a more adaptable um, and more successful military force, a national security enterprise in the future. Now, this seems to be the biggest mismatch between our approach to military force and say China's approach to military force, that we teach our guys to innovate and to be flexible and to interpret rather than to follow a rote set of orders. I mean. How do you see that playing out in this sped up technology space? Um, you know, I think allowing our people to think and have a little bit of latitude allows them to cope with ambiguity. Um, rote learning is good for knowing things. Um, an adaptive approach and mission command allows people to cope, cope with the unknown. And in war, the vast majority of things are unknown. And the interaction of forces results in much more unknown than known things. Technology does speed up the learning process. It allows us to be able to share lessons more quickly if we're clever. It allows us to have these things pervade all the way from the front line back to training institutions and I think that's important. But you know I think not everything is speeding up. Not everything needs to speed up. Um, you know it's not just about excelling in microseconds. As nations, we need to excel in decades. And you need to balance off that 
tactical excellence with strategic excellence. And if I go back to Wick Murray again, he talks about, well, you know, Germany developed tactical excellence, but they didn't have the strategy to win wars. And it's no good having these um, very brilliant, rapid tactical concepts if they don't align with your nation's strategy and policy. And that's the hard bit, right? How do you align those two? But getting strategy and policy right, I think, is perhaps the most important piece. Uh, you can't do that in microseconds. Uh, if you don't mind, I have uh, one tactical question for you, and then we'll go a little bit larger than that. Uh, you talk a lot about training and education as a means to help create not only more resilient, but more adaptive forces moving forward. I found it really intriguing uh, that you also talked about the necessity, uh, the opportunity of beginning to think about coming up with strategies of counter adaptation uh, for our adversaries, getting into their decision loops. Can you talk a little bit about what that is, what that might look like, and how do you train individuals to begin thinking in that way? Um, I guess I'll go back to 2003. I was immensely uh, fortunate to uh, make the acquaintance of a Dr. Anne-Marie Grisogano back home, who's, who's an expert in adaptation theory, complex adaptive systems. And she kind of talked me through the whole theory of adaptation and how you might be able to use this in military organisations. So we used it for my task force in Afghanistan. We built a, um, a concept around adaptation theory about we'd go in knowing we didn't know everything, but how could we change quickly after we learnt about the environment we're in. Um, and I wrote a bit about it afterwards, but essentially it was about you have to accept you're never going to know everything, but you have to put your um, organisation in a mindset where it can learn and adapt very quickly. At the same time, you want to be able to interfere with your adversary's capacity to do that. They're going to want to adapt as well, but how do you interfere with their capacity to do that? So I talk about that a bit in the book about, well, okay, so they want to adapt. How do we make sure they adapt down this pathway that's irrelevant to what we're trying to achieve. So, you know, I still think there's, I've written about it in the book, but I still think there's a bit more investigation to be done with counter adaptation, but it shouldn't just be about our learning. How do we interfere with the learning of our adversary? How do we do that in a systemic way from tactical to strategic and policy layers to ensure, to ensure they're not able to learn the right lessons, to ensure those lessons aren't able to be spread through the organisation if they're the right ones? Mm -hmm and they don't interfere with us achieving our strategic objectives. Another thing I was thinking about, and you and I had discussed this, that with the really sad news of Brendan Sargent's passing, uh, leading Australian strategic thinker, um, one of the papers that he wrote, which really is, uh, has impacted my thinking, uh, he wrote this great paper on the challenges to Australian strategic imagination. Uh, it's, it's a theoretical paper more than anything else, uh, but challenges to how Australians see themselves, see themselves in their environment, and how creative they have the ability to be in the role that they need to imagine themselves into. So uh, keying off that paper, I'd be curious uh, for two points from you. One, if we're going to build on that, what do you see uh, today as some of the impediments to Australian creative strategic thinking and then you're here you've flown all the way across the world uh, level some advice on us too what are some of the impediments uh, emanating out of washington uh, to how creative we are and ought to be um, so firstly i just pass my condolences on to brendan's family brendan was a superb human being father husband uh, mentor and teacher um, mentor of mine and a great friend of the Australian Defence College and a, a massive influence on strategic thinking across the town of Canberra um, and his loss really can't be um, overstated, it, it's tremendous loss. Um, his paper on strategic imagination, uh, when it launched last year, I was in the audience, it is a truly superb piece of work. Um, in fact, something that we hadn't really seen back home for, for a long time. Um, and it was important because we're in an era where, you know, we're not big enough as a country um, to go up against some potential adversaries. 
Uh, we're never going to have the most cutting edge technology, although we might have a lot of them. Um, for a, when you're the small dog in the fight, you need to think cleverly. And Brendan's uh, paper was all about if you're the small dog and you need to think cleverly, that cleverness needs to pervade from policy all the way down to tactics and then how, how might you be able to do that. So th there's ideas in there um, and you know it comes into risk. How much risk might you wish to take as an institution, as a nation, when it comes to your interactions with friends and, and potential adversaries? Um, how might you want to invest in developing your people? Um, how much uh, do you put into your people development versus buying things? Um, what's the balance of investment in defence versus other elements of national resilience and, and national security? I mean, defence isn't the only part of a national security complex. So he, he was posing these questions and trying to start a discussion about how do we have a more creative and imaginative approach to securing um, a whole range of policy objectives in the 21st century when there are clearly some major obstructions to us achieving them at times. Um, now, far be it from me to make recommendations to the US government on how they might do this, but I think Brendan's paper would be a good start just to read that, to you know, recalibrate the requirement for strategic imagination. I mean, yours is a country that's done this before. I mean, I think Hal Brand's book, which has just been released, is a wonderful exploration of how the United States government thought about competition from the end of the Second World War all the way through to 1990 in the Cold War. Um, and he's quite explicit in there. Not every decision was a good one. Not every move was the right one. Uh, but there was the latitude to explore new ideas, to experiment with things and when they didn't go right to learn from them and then recalibrate and then move out from there. I mean that approach, not as a plan, not as a template, but that mindset of well we need to give new ideas a go, we need to bring in a diverse range of people with different ideas which you know can be different and difficult in military organisations sometimes. Um, bringing in different ideas, give them a go um, accept failure. You know, I talked about failure right at the start of my presentation. Generally, in military and national security organisations, we're not very tolerant of failure, are we? Um, we need to be better at defining what's acceptable behaviour that we can learn from in these institutions, because I think that's going to be critical. We are going to make mistakes. We're humans. How do we ensure we're better postured to to learn from them? So, th I mean, there's a little bit in there, but I, I recommend people do read Brendan's paper. It is a wonderful piece of work, very thoughtful. And whilst he talks about it in the Australian context, it's every bit of relevant for the United States, the United Kingdom and other countries. Elliot? Uh, can I take uh, the conversation in a different direction altogether? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> science fiction. So, I um, mean, actually one of the books you should write is about how to lead, uh, I'm quite serious about this, um, how to lead an institution of, uh, a higher institution of professional military education, because you were a remarkably creative uh, leader of the Australian Defence College and of Australian professional military education altogether. And as you said, this is for military people, and you, you are one of the great military educators um, out there. So one of the ways uh, which you do that, and which you're willing to do something a little bit off the beaten path is um, to really take science fiction seriously. So talk to us about that, would you? Um, thank you, Elliot. Uh, I, I never set out to be a great military educator. Um, I have no teaching qualifications whatsoever. Uh, for me, training and education has always been uh, how we win. You know, if you can train and educate your people, you're more likely to win, you're less likely to lose your own people. So that's the big motivator for me in becoming an expert and passionate about it. Um, science fiction, I mean, I've always been a, I'm a nerd. I'll say that quite openly. You're uh, a friendly nerd. Uh, yeah, I, but it wasn't like, it wasn't the done thing to admit that until recently. But I wrote an article a few years ago about 
being a science fiction fan. I was very worried, worried when I wrote it as a military officer saying I like science fiction. There was a massive response to this. I mean, it really surprised me. I think it was back in 2016 when I wrote this. Because um, I've always felt it's a good way to nurture imagination, the creativity in our people, to explore different options in a very non-threatening way. So when I took over the college, one of the things I did was established an elective where students could... Um, we'd do about nine sessions during the year. It was on top of their normal curriculum. There's no breaks from the normal curriculum. Um, and we'd talk through, it was myself and Professor Mike Evans, um, the rationale for using science fiction to think about future force structures, future um, concepts, through future equipment. And then at the end of it, they'd write a paper. Now, the papers they would write for us would be based on priority topics from our Chief of Defence Force. It wasn't stuff I'd make up. I would talk to our Chief of Defence, say, if I'm doing this, what would you like me to look at? And we'd do that. And as each year went on, we'd evolve it and we'd change the curriculum. We'd bring in more experts. Uh, in 2019, we had a major conference. We had John Scalzi, John Birmingham, um, Kat Sparks and a, and a range of great Australian and overseas authors uh, that spoke at it. Um, and in the last year, uh, they wrote four papers, once again, that the CDF asked for, but we used Peter Singer and August Cole to mentor each of the groups that were writing these papers on space, AI, cyber, uh, climate change, I think was another one, as well as two great Australian academics from University of Queensland, Kim Wilkins um, and Helen Marshall, who also uh, undertake this kind of work. My hope has been one to make some small contribution to the future design of the force uh, in a positive way, not critiquing what we're doing now, but offer positive options for what might come in the next five or 10 or 15 years. But the other desired outcome is I'd like people to go away knowing it's okay to be creative. I mean, military organisations, and I've been part of one for 35 years and one month, and I adore our army, but at times we can be good at suppressing creativity just because of the nature of the business. My belief is we should, where we can, break open, you know, the fire hydrant and allow people to be a little bit more creative, particularly when they're going into strategic level jobs where they're thinking about future procurement, future force structure, future concepts. So hopefully, after four years of running this elective, we've got a whole bunch of young officers, not just Australian, there's, there's a whole series of foreign officers who are part of it as well, who now are out there going, you know, it's, it's okay to think a little bit differently about this stuff. I've been allowed to, I will. Okay, so quick follow-up. Two or three science fiction novels that anybody who's interested in the changing character of war ought to read. Um, I think uh, John Scalzi's Old Man War, I always recommend to people. I think... Uh, and, and, and say why. Uh, so... Old Man's War looks at a range of contemporary issues, so biological enhancement, uh, the ethics of that. I think that's a really important conversation. But it also looks at the ethics of war and why you're at war with, in this case, with other races. But you should be asking the question, well, why are we doing this? So, and he poses these questions. Um, the next one is Martha Wells' wonderful Murderbot series um, because she gets it what it is to be human. You know, it's, it's a cyborg who's constantly, he's got this inner di monologue about what am I? Am I a robot? Am I a human? And when you're talking about humans partnering with AI or partnering with robots or being augmented themselves, I think there's a really important moral discussion there about, well, what is it to be human? And what do we need to preserve that is essential to to being a human, how far can we go before we lose that essential thing that it is to be human? So I think John and, and Martha's work are both wonderful pieces of work. Um, and um, the final one I read is Haldeman's The Forever War. Um, and the reason we read that is it gets to the heart of all, what are we doing fighting each other? What's the purpose? Um, there's also themes about the veterans' experience, about coming home, about civil-military relations, which are all really important things to study. Um, but, you know, Haldeman's experience as a, as a combat engineer in Vietnam, the coming home experience was part of 
what he poured into this. So that, they'd be the three that I would recommend. But there's lots of contemporary excellent science fiction. I mean, this is, I think it's a golden age of uh, science fiction at the moment. Um, and there's many, many others you could recommend, but they'd be the first three. I love that. I come from the world of intelligence. Um, and we have intelligence failures and we have imagination failures. And the imagination failures are usually the ones that really bite you. Yeah, that's really great. And that was obviously you know, one of the findings in the 9-11 Commission, right? Where there's a failure of imagination. There's a whole section that gets into that issue. Yeah, and it gets to the risk thing too. If you can't imagine the future you're moving towards, if you can't picture what it is you're trying to get to, yep. then it's a lot harder to be willing to accept the risk to get there. Then it just seems like an abstract problem that's waiting out there for you. But if yep. you can picture, like, this is how this is going to go down and this is what we need to do to prepare for it, I think it, it becomes a lot more real. Um, I would add Ghost Fleet to your, your list, which I just loved. And I thought, you know, every young person coming to Washington that I talk to, I'm like, read Ghost Fleet. This is exactly how the first part of the next war is going to go down. No, I, I think um, Singer and Cole's Ghost Fleet is superb. Um, you know, its examination of near future warfare um, covers a whole range of issues that are, are really important. But it's also part of a long tradition of science fiction looking at near future. I mean, you had Red Storm Rising, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, even all the way back to the late 1870s where this kind of fiction started to take off because once again, there was a technological revolution going on and people were exploring um, uh, new ways of uh, warfare in France, in the UK. Frank Stockton in the United States wrote a great novel at the turn of the century about uh, a corporate, uh, 28 corporations getting together uh, under contract to the US Congress to wage war against the UK. Um, so there's a great tradition of novelists looking at uh, future warfare, uh, but I think Singer and Cole's Ghost Fleet really stands out because it's had a major impact uh, on a whole generation of military people, but a whole generation of national security practitioners, uh, whether it's on the Hill or in think tanks. Um, and I think that kind of influence and those kind of stories are important because we're humans, we like stories. And not everyone's gonna read a dense academic book, but boy, that story, I think it really resonates with people because they can go, I can see that happen. Boy, I better do something to make sure that doesn't happen to us. Exactly. You know, it's, it's funny, when uh, Ghost Fleet came out, um, the book that it reminded me most of was not a science fiction book, uh, but it was a book that came out at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, The Riddle of the Sands. So now we can combine our conversation because, Emily, it's generally thought of as one of the first modern espionage novels, although it's not really. For those of you who haven't read it, it's a bunch, a bunch of you know, British toffs who are sailing around the Danish coastline, and weird things start to happen. Now, it was written in, I believe, 1904 or 1905. They begin to hear a lot of German being spoken. And they're not sure what's going on. There's a love interest that happens. But lo and behold, there are bulldozers there. And it's the Germans are bulldozing what becomes you know, a canal to the sea. Now, the reason that this story is so interesting is that uh, a young Winston Churchill reads this right before he goes into the Admiralty. Mm -hmm. And he stands up the North Sea Fleet and pulls in the author of the book to work with him. So you were talking about science fiction as a prompt to think about platforms, uh, ethical challenges, but also about problems that we haven't imagined, but that might materialize and change the strategic landscape that you're operating in. When your students are going through this seminar that you lead or when you're giving them these books, what is drawing their attention most? Is it things that they can get or actions that they want to prompt that haven't yet been considered mm. in army, in government? I think that's largely it. I, the first couple of electives we ran, most of the participants were science fiction fans. Hmm. The last one we ran in 2021, I think out of the whole group of about 45 people, there was one. Like none of them were science fiction fans, but they saw something in thinking about the future that they, they saw value in. I mean, we use military history to think about the future why not use the future to think about the future as well? Um, and there isn't a future. That's a great thing about science fiction. There's a whole range of potential futures that I think we need to consider. Now, that makes it hard because then you've got to prioritise resources and all those kind of things. But science fiction allows you very cheaply to explore potential futures rather than one 
imagined future. Different question, if I could. Um, as you look at different militaries around the world, uh, which ones, do, well, first, do you think that any has done any better than anybody else in figuring out what this new world uh, looks like mm. in terms of uh, war being transformed and which advanced militaries, or if necessary, you can point the finger at us, do you think have not done a particularly mm. good job of adjusting uh, to it? You know, there's, there's a few I always look at. I mean, I always, and I explore this in the book, I certainly look at the Russians because they really value thinking about military sciences, um, you know, and their development, the operational art in the interwar period, I think was a really important milestone in, in, in the military profession. Um, so some of the work they've done more recently, I know there's this term out there, the Gerasimov doctrine, it's, it's actually not a thing, but Gerasimov has led change in thinking about war and I think that's an important role of a senior leader. So I always watch what they're doing and their, their new military doctrine I hope will come out soon because that will be interesting to have a look at. You know, I look at the Chinese and there's a whole lot of other things besides systems, destruction, warfare that they've been doing and I explore some of the other concepts in how they think about AI and these kind of things. Obviously, um, the US military, multi-domain warfare has been an important development. I don't think it's the solution, but I think it's an important waypoint on the way to a solution. At the end of the day, these are all just hypotheses, right? They're hypotheses about what we think might work in a future conflict. And I'll go back to Andrew Marshall. They'll all be tested. One will be, you know, there can be only one, the one that's the winning one, and that will be the one that everyone then adopts. I mean, in World War II, the one they all ended up adopting was combined arms operations with air land support on the land and then carrier-based aviation with amphibious landings at sea because that was proven to be the successful things in those domains. And I think we'll see the same in future. We'll see all these hypotheses from different cultures and different nations. Once it comes to it and we have to fight, we'll find the one thing that will be successful and everyone will start adopting their own variants of that. Look, before we leave, uh, I want to take a question. Uh, David, a uh, retired um, uh, US Marine Corps, asked, uh, he keyed in on our conversation about books uh, and really about reading, though. Uh, and he, we can leave sci-fi behind. We've talked about that. We've got that covered. You've given your recommendations. Uh, but his question was, if, if you buy what General Ryan is selling, that we need to get much quicker in how we think about what we're doing and change and reformulate how we conceptualize our education and our training in order to adapt faster, what should be your starting point? You have an incoming class uh, of officers. Uh, beyond just reading suggestions, what's going to reinforce the urgency, the timeliness of some of the matters that your book takes up? Where should they start? Well, the, one way to speed up learning a bit is to have teachers who are passionate and excite their students about learning. Learning's easy when you're excited about the topic and when you've got professors and teachers who are excited, passionate, knowledgeable, want to be there. So that's the first thing you need to do in every military institution, have instructors that are all those things. Because students look at them and go, I want to be here. I want to learn from these people. That supercharges learning. You don't need any technology to do that. So the quality of your teachers, and that's not just a military thing, right? That's everywhere. But that is one way to supercharge learning. And it's actually not expensive. Like education is very cheap compared to a lot of other things. So that's one way to do it. I think, secondly, connectivity is the other way we've done it. And we've seen that informally. And I mentioned in my speech, I mean, you see this generation of junior and middle ranking officers who over the last 10, 15 years have just connected informally across the world. And there's all these, you know, Military Writers Guild, Grounded Curiosity, and a whole range of others that are out there that have just been superb at bringing together a community of fellow travellers and exploring different ideas, testing different ideas, but supporting each other and being advocates for people to learn and stick their head above the parapet with different ideas. So. Good teachers and good connectivity would be the first two steps for them. 
Well, we have, I think, a prime example of what that means to be both uh, with us here today. It's, it's a real honor to host you for the launch of this book, but really for the work that you've done in setting an example of how you lead with learning, by learning, and encouraging people to do this, not at one stage of their career, not when you get to branch off for one year, but all the way through and into retirement and beyond. So thank you uh, for thank you. this. Uh, for those of you who don't know already, you can follow uh, General Ryan at War in the Future. I know you have many, many followers. It's because he is leading on how to connect, how to read, what to think about. Congratulations on the launch you, of your Charles. book. Uh, Emily and Elliot, thanks so much Thank for you. joining Thank us. You. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. And we look into the future to see how uh, we progress. We sure do. Thank you very much.